As we look at different ways to write code to solve problems, one consideration we may want to take into account is the efficiency of the code we write. In order to do so, though, we need to define how we're going to measure efficiency. Take, for example, two different algorithms for sorting elements of a list. We have insertion sort, which sorts a list by inserting elements one at a time into an initially empty list, placing each element into its correct sorted place. And we have merge sort, which sorts a list via a divide and conquer strategy of recursively splitting the list in half, sorting each half, and then merging the sorted halves together. Which of these two algorithms takes less time to run? Well, the answer depends. It depends on what input we're sorting on. How long the input is and what order the elements are already in might matter, for example. And it depends on how our code is computed, what kind of computer the code is run on, how quickly it can execute basic operations, and so forth. To account for differences in input size affecting the time it takes for an algorithm to run, instead of using a single number to describe the performance of an algorithm, we'll describe performance with a function a function that takes the size of the input and gives us the time required to solve the problem. And since different inputs of the same size might require different amounts of time, we'll often just plan for the worst and consider the worst case complexity, a function from input sizes to the worst case time needed for the algorithm to solve a problem of that size. And ideally, we'd like this measurement of worst case complexity to ignore the particulars of the computer system it's running on. Factors like the computer's CPU speed or what else is running on the computer at the same time. We want an abstract notion of efficiency that ignores those particulars. This abstract notion too should care about how functions grow asymptotically. That is to say, as the inputs grow large. With insertion sort and merge sort, for example, insertion sort is often faster on smaller inputs but as the inputs get larger, merge sort becomes much more efficient. We'd like to capture that fact. To solve these problems, we'll use big O notation, a generic way of expressing the growth rate of a function. Given a function f, big O of f is the set of functions that grow no faster than f. Intuitively speaking, say that f is a function whose input is n and whose output is n squared. Here we're using Church's lambda notation for functions. In this case, if we had another function whose input is n and whose output is n, it grows no faster than f, so it's in big O of f. But a function from n to n cubed does grow faster than f, so it's not in big O of f. But that's not a very precise definition, so let's provide a formal definition of big O. An initial definition might be to say that big O of f is the set of all functions g, so that for all n, g of n is less than or equal to f of n. But that's not quite right for a few reasons. First, we're trying to characterize what happens when inputs get large. So it doesn't matter as much to us which function is larger when the inputs are small, we care about which one is eventually larger when the inputs are larger. So we'll say that g of n is less than or equal to f of n must hold for all n larger than some value n naught. In other words, eventually we'll get past the few input sizes where g of n is bigger, and at that point f of n will be bigger. Next, if two algorithms running times differ by just a constant factor, that's not really anything to do with their intrinsic rate of asymptotic growth. We want to focus on characterizing how functions grow independent of those constants. So instead, we'll say that g of n is less than or equal to some constant c times f of n. To take an example, is the function from n to 10n squared plus 3 in big O of the function from n to n squared? To show that the answer is yes, we just need to find values for c and n naught so that for all values of n larger than n naught, 10 n squared plus 3 is less than or equal to c times n squared. And it turns out that's true when n naught is 0 and c is 13. For all positive values n, 10 n squared plus 3 is less than or equal to 13 n squared. Often when writing formulations in big O notation, 
we'll use the body of a function when what we really mean is the function itself. So we can write an expression like 10n squared plus 3 is in big O of n squared, when what we really mean is that the function from n to 10n squared plus 3 is in the set big O of the function from n to n squared. Big O ends up being useful to us because it groups together entire classes of functions that have similar growth rates. For example, adding a constant to a function doesn't change its big O classification. Multiplying a function by a constant doesn't change its big O classification either. And for polynomial functions, lower degree terms and constants don't affect the big O classification. So even if we have a polynomial with a lot of terms, we can focus on just the highest degree term and ignore the constants to determine the function's big O classification. Then, using a function's big O classification, we can compare whether certain functions grow faster or slower than others. Functions with bigger exponents grow faster than functions with lower exponents. Linear functions grow faster than logarithmic functions. Exponential functions grow faster than polynomial functions. And exponential functions with a larger base grow faster than exponential functions with a smaller base. But in order for big O to be useful to us when analyzing the programs we write, we need some way to take a program and determine what function characterizes the amount of time the program needs. Only then will we be able to determine the big O classification for that function. One method for doing so is to solve recurrence equations. Let's take an example. Here's an OCaml function append that takes two lists as input, and returns the list of one list appended to the other. What we'd like to do is write a mathematical function, t append, that takes arguments n and m and returns the amount of time required to run the append function on lists with n and m elements. There are a few things we do know about this function. First, we can describe what happens when the first input to the function is zero. In that case, the function matches x's against the empty list and returns y's. Each of those operations takes some constant amount of time. So we can say that the amount of time required to call append on inputs of size 0 and m is some constant for how much time it takes to match, plus some constant for how much time it takes to return y's. And since the sum of two constants is just a constant, let's simplify and say that the amount of time is just some constant c. The more interesting case is what happens if the first argument is non-empty. In that case, we match the list to a head and a tail, and then cons the head onto the result of recursively calling the append function on the tail and the argument y's. So we would characterize the running time as some constant amount of time for the match, some constant amount of time for the cons, and then t append of n and m. We need to add however much time it would take to recursively call the append function on lists of length n and m. And since the sum of constants is just a constant again, we can simplify to just a constant k plus the time for the recursive call to append. This gives us two recurrence equations to characterize the running time of the append function. And now what we'd like to do is find some closed form solution, that is to say, a non-recursive solution, to describe the running time. We'll do so by unfolding this recurrence equation. Say we started with t append of n and m for some positive value for n. What is this equal to? Well, according to our second recurrence equation, it's equal to k plus t append of n minus 1 and m. But we can take it a step further and unfold that recursive call to t append. Using the second recurrence equation again, that's equal to k plus t append of n minus 2 and m. And that recursive call is equal to k plus t append of n minus 3 and m. And that process will keep repeating until we get to t append of 0 and m. How many k's appear in this resulting expression? We had to do this unfolding n times to get from a first argument of n down to a first argument of 0. So there are n instances of k summed up in this expression. So we could rewrite the expression as k times n 
plus t append of 0 and m. And a call to t append where the first argument is 0, we know is just some constant c, according to our first recurrence equation. So that gives us our closed form solution. The time it takes to append lists of length n and m is k times n plus c, where k and c are both some constants. Notice that the time required depends only on n, the size of the first argument, and not on m, the size of the second argument. That's consistent with what we would expect, since the append function never looks inside the structure of the second argument. The function's behavior never depends on how many elements are in that list. k times n plus c we know is in big O of n, as the constant factors don't matter. So we can say that the function append takes time linear in the length of its first argument. Let's see if we can apply that technique now to analyzing the running times of the sorting algorithms insertion sort and merge sort we were looking at before. Here is insertion sort again, which relies on calling the insert function in the body of the sort function. So before we analyze the time required to perform insertion sort, let's analyze the time required for just performing the insert operation. We'll define a function t insert for the time it takes to insert into a list of length n. When the list is of length 0, it just takes some constant amount of time to insert, however long it takes to match, plus the amount of time it takes to return a new list with one element. We'll call that constant c. What about inserting into a positive length list of length n plus 1? Here we have a conditional. If the element x is greater than the head, then the amount of time necessary is some constant amount of time for the match and the cons, we'll call that time k1, plus the amount of time it takes to recursively call insert, which is a t insert of n. And if the element is not greater than the head, then the amount of time necessary is just some constant amount of time for the match and the cons, we'll call that time k2. But without knowing in advance which branch of the computation we'll use, we don't know which of these is the correct running time. Here's where we'll follow the principle of considering the worst case complexity. We'll assume that the actual running time is whichever of these two is bigger, and take the maximum of the two. Even then though, without knowing the values for these constants, we won't know which is bigger. But we can be sure that the result won't be bigger than the sum of the two. So we'll consider the sum k1 plus t insert of n plus k2, or after consolidating the constants together, just k plus t insert of n. This is very similar to what we had before when analyzing the complexity of the append function. We can unfold t insert of n repeatedly, getting n instances of the constant k plus some constant c. So as a result, we can say that the running time of insert is in big O of n. We can then use that information to analyze the running time of insertion sort. Insertion sort on a list of length 0 will take some constant c time to process. Insertion sort on a list of length n plus 1 will take some constant k time, plus however long it takes to sort a list of length n, plus however long it takes to call insert on a list of length n. How do we solve this recurrence equation? Let's try unfolding again. The time it takes to perform insertion sort on a list of length n is a constant k plus the time required for insertion sort on a list of length n minus 1 plus the time to call insert on a list of length n minus 1, which we know is in big O of n minus 1. We can unfold the recursive call t i sort n minus 1 into k plus t i sort of n minus 2 plus big O of n minus 2. And we can keep unfolding again and again so that we get n instances of the constant k plus a constant c plus the sum from i equals 0 to n of big O of i. There's a mathematical identity that the sum of values from 0 to n is n times n plus 1 divided by 2, which is in big O of n squared. So that ends up being the dominant term here. The running time of insertion sort is therefore in big O of n squared. What about the running time of merge sort? Merge sort relies on two helper functions, 
split, which takes a list and splits it into two lists, and merge, which takes two sorted lists and merges them together into a new sorted list. Both of these functions are linear in the size of their arguments. If you'd like, you can try to use the unfolding technique we've seen a few times now and apply it to these two functions to demonstrate that both are in big O of n. What we're interested in then is using this information to help us determine the running time of merge sort. Merge sort on an empty list or on a list of length 1 both require some constant amount of time. We'll call that constant c1. And merge sort on a list of length n will require some constant amount of time c2, plus however long it takes to split a list of length n, plus two times however long it takes to call merge sort on a list of length n divided by 2, since we're recursively calling the function twice, plus however long it takes to call merge on two lists whose total size is n. We can simplify this expression a little bit. We know that both split and merge are linear time operations, so we can combine some constants and say that merge sort takes some linear amount of time, call it k times n plus c, where k and c are some constants, plus two times the time required to call merge sort on a list of length n divided by 2. This is a common divide and conquer pattern in recurrence equations, and we can solve it again by unfolding. If we keep repeatedly unfolding the recurrence equation and combining terms, eventually we'll reach the case where we call tm sort on a list of length 1, which just has some constant running time. But how many times did we unfold here? We unfolded for every time we took the size of the input and divided it by 2, which means that for a list of length n, we unfolded log of n times. And that tells us something about our answer. For each of our log n times we had to unfold, we got an extra k times n term, so that gives us k times n times log n. For each of our log n times we had to unfold, we also got some number of additional constant c terms. The number of c's increased the more times we recursively called merge sort, but for each unfolding, it was never more than the total number of elements n, so there can't be more than n times log n instances of the constant c. And then we have some additional constant value that's repeated n times in the last step. The dominant term in all of this is n times log n, which gives us our big O classification. Merge sort runs in time big O of n log n, which grows more slowly than functions in big O of n squared. That tells us that merge sort asymptotically is more efficient than insertion sort. So with recurrence equations, we can take the code we write and translate it into equations that we can use to define a function for how much time it takes for that code to run based on input size. And then with big O notation, we can characterize the overall growth rate of those functions to get an abstract notion of efficiency, to characterize just how efficient our algorithms really are.